morning service on the 25th, um, look for, instead, look for a video to be pushed out this week, um, Saturday night, Sunday morning? It'll be up and ready to go first thing Sunday morning. Okay, first thing Sunday morning, uh, it, you, we'll have a video on our YouTube channel for you and for your family uh, to watch and enjoy as, as, uh, together, and so we encourage you to do that um, uh, this coming, um, well, next Sunday, I guess. So we're grateful that we can celebrate Christmas together on Saturday night and then enjoy uh, an opportunity to be at home watching this video on Sunday morning as well. Well, over the course of the last several weeks, we have uh, lit the candle, the candles uh, on our Advent wreath. And so first we lit the prophecy candle, the candle that's, that talked of the prophecies of the coming king. Second, we lit the um, candle that referred to the promise, the promise that the angel gave to Mary, that she would be the mother of our Savior. And then thirdly, last week, we lit the praise candle, a candle that represented Mary's response to the angel, one of praise, and, mag- and it's called the Magnificent. It's, it's what she, how she praised God for, for what he was going to do through her. Today, we're lighting a candle representing the purpose. Why did he come? And in that vein, I want to read from Galatians chapter 3 and from chapter 4. Here's what Paul says. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might be, receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but you are a son. And if you're a son, then you're an heir through God. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. That's the purpose. We want to praise the Lord this morning because he did that. He came to redeem us from the law. And so in doing, I want to light this morning a candle representing the purpose of his coming. Would you stand with me right now? I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to continue to worship the Lord together in song. We're grateful, Father. Thank you so much for the fact that you sent your Son to come. And we celebrate that this morning. And you came into a world that was under the law, and you took that on, and you walked this life, and you, you dealt with what we dealt with. And then you went to the cross, and when the time was right, you saved us, you you freed us from the law. And so we're grateful for that. Now we can come to you this morning as sons and daughters of the king because you love us. We are heirs of your household. Help us to understand that even better this morning, we pray. And may you get the glory and the worship and the praise for all of those things. So thank you, Father, that we can be here this morning to consider you turn our hearts and our minds to you as we worship, as we praise, as we look to you. And we ask these in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Yes, sing hallelujah. That song, did you catch there, references what he has already done and then talks about what he will do. There's two things happening, or that some have, some things have happened. He was born for the cross. And there's some things yet to happen. He's going to return to ransom us and to reign over all. Those are the two things. And right now, today, we stand in between those two moments. We stand in between the first coming and we stand before the second coming. And we can worship and sing hallelujah for those reasons. Praise the Lord for those things. And this morning, we're going to look at Psalm number 96 and Psalm 96, I think, does this a little bit. It, 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 it points us upward to who he is and what he has done and what he will do. And so uh, if you have your scripture available, I'd encourage you to turn open to Psalm 96. 
And we're going to illustrate this with a little bit of other passages this morning as we look at what the psalmist is writing here in Psalm 96. So as you open toward that, toward that place, let me pray for us. We're grateful, Father, the, the light of the world that was to come, has come, and yet will come. And so we don't fully understand all those things, but all, all, what we really know is that Jesus came, he was the light of the world, and that right now he's standing, he's sitting at your right hand, and he's going to return again. And so as we consider that this morning, would you open our eyes to you, and would you turn our hearts to you, and would you settle us on you? And the outcome of this, of this conversation, this message this morning, let it be praise and worship and glory and honor to you and to you alone, because there is no one else worthy. And so as we come together this morning around your word, would you open our ears, open our hearts, open our minds? Would you make my tongue your tongue? I need you right now this morning, so would you come in this place and work in all of us in this room for your purposes? And we ask these in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to start by reading Psalm number 96. Here's what the psalmist says. O sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. And then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. And that's Psalm 96. Clearly, it's a psalm that's overwhelmingly positive, praise-inducing, worship-encouraging. It calls us to praise the Lord, to exalt him to ascribe to him glory and majesty, to fear him in reverence, to tell of him and to sing to him. And we do those things because of who he is. That's why we ascribe to him glory and praise. It's the result of the attributes of the Lord, as this psalm mentions several of those. Now, we don't actually know who wrote this psalm, the author is not given. But much of the psalm is a direct quote from a song of praise that David sang as he was leading the ark into uh, the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem for the first time as it was to be set in the Jerusalem tabernacle until David's son Solomon could build a proper temple for the ark to permanently reside. So this bringing this Ark to Jerusalem for the first time was a very festive occasion. Lots of celebrating, lots of shouting, lots of horns and cymbals and harps and singing and dancing and lyres. And as, the, as David led the horde of worshipers into Jerusalem and as he, to set the Ark in its holy place, he had the musicians sing this song that's recorded here in Psalm number 96. Now, you can read about that story and about that song in 1 Chronicles chapters 15 and 16. So, here in Psalm 96, either David is the direct author of this psalm, or the actual author heavily quoted David in the writing of this psalm. Either way, this psalm is one of praise and celebration and worship and rejoicing, and it represents this great celebration that 
commemorated or that remembered the bringing in of the ark into the holy city to set into its holy place. It's a lofty psalm meant to ascribe glory and to stir up celebration. And in this psalm, we see several praise-inducing attributes of God. And of those attributes, we're going to look at four of them this morning. And the first is found in verse 5, praise-inducing attribute number 1. Here's what the psalmist writes, For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. The Lord made the heavens. That is, he is the creator. And this differentiates him from all other gods. The little g gods. Those gods are worthless idols. They can't do anything. But the Lord, the God of Israel, the capital G God, is the creator. He made everything. He made the heavens. He alone did that. This reminds me of what Paul has to say about Jesus in Colossians chapter 1. And here's what Paul says. He... The he in verse 15 refers to Jesus Christ. And so he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he's before all things, And in him, all things hold together. And so Paul in Colossians connects the concept of the Lord as creator, mentioned in Psalm 96, to the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus is identified as the creator. And as the creator, he's different. He's far above all other gods that we as humans might invent or imagine. And he's alone the creator. That means he's set apart and worthy of praise as this psalm, as Psalm 96, calls us to do. Now the second praise-inducing attribute for us to consider uh, this morning is this, from verse number 10. The psalmist writes, Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. So not only did the Lord create all things, but he reigns over all things as well. Now Brandon addressed this last week in our look at Psalm number 2, and just like we discussed that last week, Psalm 96 says the same thing. All things are his. He's over everything. He's the king of all things. He's rightfully enthroned over all things. And all things ultimately submit to him. This reminds me of how uh, David opens Psalm number 24, where David wrote this, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, meaning everything that's in it. And the world and those who dwell therein, meaning everybody, all the people. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. The earth is the Lord's, everything, and everyone. They all subject themselves to him. And from Hebrews chapter 1, the author of Hebrews says, He, again, Jesus Christ is who the author is referring to. He, Jesus Christ, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Jesus upholds the universe by the word of his power. And so the author of Hebrews even connects this idea of the Lord as reigning king and sustaining king to Jesus Christ. Not only did he create all of this, but he also reigns over all of this and all of us. And the fact of his universal kingship means that he is worthy of praise. Now the third praise-inducing psalm or attribute this morning from Psalm 96 is mentioned here in verse 10 
and it's reiterated in verse 13. It's that the Lord is the judge. The Lord is the judge. So from verse 10, he will judge the peoples with equity. And from verse 13, before the Lord, for he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. And so the psalmist is calling us to praise the Lord for his role as judge. Now, the references to the Lord's role as judge, while the Lord is the rightful judge, you notice here in Psalm 96 that the judging referenced in this psalm is future tense. He will judge. So the psalm writer, in the, as he wrote this, is looking forward to a future day in which the righteous and faithful judge will do the task of judging. And because, is the, the, because the Lord is the judge and will one day do the judging, he is worthy of our praise. Now, this reminds me of what Jesus says about himself in Matthew chapter 25. Here's what Jesus, this is Jesus speaking. When the Son of Man, that is Jesus, the Son of Man refers to Jesus, so when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne and before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. And the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And those, these will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And this isn't the only time Jesus refers to himself as judge. He knows he's the judge. And so in Psalm 96, when the psalm writer is looking ahead to the, to the Lord judging, and Jesus shows up on the scene, he knows this is him. He knows he's the judge. He's the future supreme judge. He is the judge, and one day he will act as that judge. And so judgment belongs to the Lord. And so we see here that the Lord Jesus is creator, sustainer, and rightful future judge. And all these things stir us to give him praise. Now the last attribute to mention is actually a series of attributes. Uh, the psalm describes the Lord using a collection of godly qualities such as he is glorious in verse 3, he is great in verses 4 and verse 8. Uh, he is surrounded by splendor and majesty and strength and beauty in verse 6. He is holy in verse 9. He is righteous and faithful in verse 13. These are who he is. And some of these are character qualities like holiness and righteousness. Those are part of his character. Others are description of his, descriptions of his kingly standing, such as majesty and beauty. And in either case, these qualities show the Lord wholly and fully set apart in his grandeur and magnificence. There is no one like him. And all these qualities are good. They're excellent. They're wonderful. And as I read this list of attributes here in Psalm 96, my mind flashes to uh, John's vision of the throne room of God in Revelation chapter 4. Here's what John sees in Revelation 4. He says this, starting at verse 2. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne, and he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. And around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and seated on those thrones were twenty-four elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads." And from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne 
there uh, was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And whenever the living creatures uh, give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down and worship him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne, saying... Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. That's quite a picture. That's quite a picture of God's glory, of these qualities of majesty and beauty and righteousness and justice and faithfulness. It's also a picture of him being worthy of praise. He's magnificent. He's majestic. He's great. He's holy. He's righteous. He's faithful. He's beautiful. He's worthy. And Psalm 96 captures those qualities and invites us to worship and praise and celebrate and rejoice in the Lord. Now, as I put all this together, and I, th- and, and I think this through a little bit, as, I, as I've already suggested, what strikes me about these things is that when the Jewish writer wrote the psalm, whether it be David or somebody else, he was describing the attributes of God that would be contained in or revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember Colossians 2, verse 9, Paul says this, that in him, in Christ, The fullness of God dwells in bodily form. It's all in Jesus. He holds it all. He contains it all. It's all in him. So the author of Psalm 96 was writing about the Lord, the creator, the God above all gods, who reigns over everything and who would come in the future to judge the earth in righteousness and holiness. And in doing so, he was describing the Messiah. And if this psalm was written by David around the time that the Ark of the Covenant was finally being brought to Jerusalem, he was writing roughly a thousand years before uh, the birth of Jesus Christ. And so in this psalm, the writer was describing and looking forward to the coming king, the redeemer, the judge. He was looking forward to the coming of the Messiah, the Holy One, who had come to righteously judge the earth. That's what makes Psalm 96 a Christmas passage. The psalmist was at least in part looking ahead toward the coming. Now what we find interesting about this psalm as a Christmas passage is that to the Old Testament Jewish writer or reader, the idea of the coming Messiah was a one-time deal. It was expected, by and large, that in one fell swoop the Messiah would come, he would declare himself king, he would take the throne of David, and he would wipe out all of Israel's enemies and usher in a time of peace and prosperity. The Old Testament Jews had some difficulty around making sense of the prophecies in Scripture that talked about the coming Messiah as a bleeding sufferer or as a lowly servant. And so they emphasized the other prophecies, like the Messiah coming as a king or as a conqueror. And that's in part why the religious leaders of Jesus' day rejected Jesus as the Messiah. He did not come as they expected him to. They didn't recognize the coming of the Messiah as described in the Old Testament was actually a two separate comings. They didn't understand that he would come in his first coming to submit and in his second coming to reign. That he would come in his first coming as the suffering redeemer of sinners and his second coming as the ruling king of all the earth. And his first coming as the savior, his second coming as the judge. That in his first coming, he would come as a newborn baby in a dusty manger. and his second coming, he would come as a conquering warrior carrying a rod of conquest. The first coming, he would ride a humble donkey. Second coming, ride a white horse. 
First coming, he would come to die. Second coming, he would come to kill. First coming, he comes to reconcile. Second coming, he comes to restore. The Jewish readers didn't understand that the advent of the Messiah was a two-event phenomenon. And so, when Psalm 96 speaks of the Lord as a holy and righteous and splendid creator and ruler who will come to judge the world, the writer is not primarily celebrating the first coming of the Messiah where he comes as a, a little baby in a dusty manger. The psalm is celebrating the second coming of the Messiah the coming in which he will ride in on a right horse and the absolute conquering king. Now, for us, where we're at today, sometimes perhaps we wonder how the Jews could have missed Jesus as the Messiah. But even Jesus' disciples had a hard time grasping Jesus' suffering. They had expected conquest, not humiliation and rejection. And when they had thought about the coming Messiah, a humble, suffering servant born in a barn and crucified on a cross was not the first thing that came to mind. Now, some theologians over the years have described this issue uh, in the the, uh, illustration of two mountain peaks. So if you look at a mountain from a specific angle, it may look as though the two peaks are actually of the same mountain. For example, look at this. You see two peaks in the distance. Are they two separate mountains or are they one? From this perspective, it appears to be they are one. And yet, if you look at this from a different angle, they are two completely different mountains separated by some distance. And so, one perspective, they look like one. Another perspective, they're very clearly two. Get that? One, two. Okay. Now, how does this relate to Bible prophecy and the coming Messiah? Well, to an Old Testament Jewish reader, the prophecies about the coming Messiah may have looked very much like one mountain. Christ would have come one time and would have fulfilled all the Old Testament messianic prophecies in one event or one series of events. But to us today, 3,000 years after Psalm 96 was written, we stand somewhere in between the first coming and the second coming, and we see both. We see in both directions. We have the benefit of looking back at the first coming of the Messiah, Jesus, and the prophecies that were fulfilled in his first coming. And just like the Old Testament prophets, we look ahead at the second coming in which the remaining prophecies about the Messiah will be fulfilled. And so there we are. And in between the first coming and the second coming, we live in this time of the Gentiles. It's the time in which, due to a partial hardening of the Jews, the gospel had gone out to the Gentile world, and the Gentiles have been, have been and continue to be coming to Christ in faith all around the world. And praise God for the time of the Gentiles. Because unless you're Jewish, and I suspect most of us in this room are not Jewish, we Gentiles would still be left lost and drowning in our sins and separated from God if it wasn't for God in his mercy inserting a time of Gentiles into the timeline of human history. And so while we stand here today in the time of the Gentiles, we expectantly await his second coming when he will come to set all things straight, when he will come to to destroy his enemies, when he will physically reign over all the earth, and when he will judge from his throne, and when he will give us resurrected bodies and reward us for that which which we have done in our time on the earth, when he will take his rightful place on the throne and reign forever and ever, when every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth will bow before Jesus and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, Lord of all, to the glory of God the Father. 
That day is coming. We're here in the middle. We're in the in-between. Rest assured, that's going to come. And this time of His second return. And so now, this Christmas season, we celebrate His first coming. We must also recognize that we eagerly wait in anticipation for His second coming. Just like the psalm writer, we look forward to the revealing of the holy and righteous and glorious and majestic Lord who created, who reigns, who will judge. Just like the Jews of a thousand years B.C. awaited for the coming Messiah, we too, 2,000 years after his coming, his first coming, we await the returning of the Messiah. We look back at his first coming in which some prophecies were fulfilled. We look ahead at the second coming in which the rest will be fulfilled. I got to think we're getting close. I, don't, I, I can't tell the future. I read a lot of people. People have predictions here, predictions there. I got to think we're getting close. I am amazed at what's happening right now in the world as pieces, from my perspective, fall into place. Is the fruit tree in season? It might be. As we watch and as we wait, what do we do? Well, the psalmist calls us to wait and watch with praise and expectancy and thanksgiving and worship and celebration. And that makes Christmas a two-direction celebration. We celebrate what's been done by Christ, and we celebrate what will be done by Christ. And in those things, whether what he has done or what he will do, he's worthy of praise either way. And so here in Psalm 96... The writer calls us to respond to the things about God in several ways. The first I want to mention is in in verses uh, 1 and 2. Our response is to sing. The psalm writer says, O sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Now, notice the directive in verses 1 and 2 is to all the earth. All the earth sing. And we join in with all creation in singing to the Lord songs that bless his name. Now, the natural world does this by nature. Even the rocks can cry out. We, as the crown of creation, we have been given a choice to, a choice to sing to the Lord. We are told to do so here. We can choose to sing to him. We can choose to praise him. And in this case, in verses 1 and 2, these are to be new songs. That is, new songs that capture our praise to God. Or I might suggest even old songs that are sung with new fervor or a fresh robustness. Now, I'm not much of a singer. You don't want me to be much of a singer, actually. I can't carry a tune. And anyway, most of the time, I'd rather just remain silent. Several years ago, I took a personal retreat uh, for a couple of days out to a small inn in a small town. I didn't take much with me. I took a Bible, I took a journal, and I took a dusty old church hymn book. And as I was holed up in this uh, hotel room for a couple of days, I found that those old hymns, in that old hymn book came alive to me. And the words of those old hymns jumped off the page as I chewed on them and as they trickled down into my soul. They were old songs sung in my heart in a new way. And that was a very rich couple days of worship. And yet I also appreciate the new music being published today. Songs that direct our minds and hearts upward in a fresh and in a modern way. Now, either way, 
old songs in a new way or new songs altogether, one response is to sing to the Lord and to bless his name. And the psalm writer calls us to do so. Second response is in verses 2 and 3. Our response to the Lord is to tell of his salvation from day to day to declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among the peoples. And in verse 10, he says, Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. So one way we praise him is by telling of him, by telling of his salvation and the work he has done, by declaring his glory and proclaiming his reign. We do this through songs that we reference back in verses 1 and 2. We also do it as we go about our, our lives from day to day, sharing with those around us of God's great work and his salvation. Glory is ascribed to the Lord as we talk of what God has done and is doing in us and around us. And glory is ascribed as we invite others to join us in praising him for that work that he is doing. It's one of my favorite parts about working here at the church. I get to hear how the Lord is at work in people's lives. Even when that work of God's is done through suffering and hardship and tears. The Lord is at work. It's evident. He's at work among us. And as we share that with others, he gets the glory. And as we share that work with the world around us, they're invited to join us in praising the God of the universe who saves and reigns and who is glorious. Tell of his salvation from day to day, the psalm writer says. Third response. Verse number four says to fear him above all other gods. Here's what the psalmist says, verse four. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. And so we praise him by speaking of him and who he is, by speaking of him to others of who he is, and by living a life of praise that seeks to submit to his authority in our lives. And we do this out of reverent fear, knowing that he is God, and all other little gods that motivate us or tempt us are to be ignored and discarded as we live in the praise of the one true God. Now, John Calvin once said that the human heart is an idol factory. In our day and age, we, and in our culture, we don't bow down to little stone and little metal idols. Instead, our idols are things in our hearts that we put above God, things like comfort or security or power or control or reputation or approval or success. And these are things we put above God. And the psalm writer says to fear the Lord above all other gods, and so we fear the Lord by putting him first and, putting, and, and submitting to him in our lives. And thank God that he shows us our little idols that grew up in our hearts so that we can bring them to him in confession and repentance, and we can turn from them and to the one and only praiseworthy God. Let him reveal his, your idols in your heart. You and I all have them. Let him reveal those to us and then repent. Fourthly, we're told to ascribe in verses 7 and 8, verse 7, ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Now the word ascribe, when used in the Bible, essentially means to give or to attribute. So to ascribe or to attribute to the Lord the glory due his name means that we recognize and acknowledge the glory that God already has. It is to wholeheartedly agree with him about who he is. And so we agree with or we attribute to God glory and strength. He is glorious, he is strong, he is beautiful, he is majestic. We agree with him on those things. And this is very similar to worship, where we attribute worth to God. And that leads to our fifth and final response. We worship the Lord and rejoice in him. Verse 9, 
Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Verse 11, let the heavens be glad. Let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar in all that, feel, that fills it. Let the field exult in everything in it. We join in with all nature. What's the old song, the old hymn? We join together with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, glory, and love. Is that right? Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. We ascribe to him his worth, and we gladly rejoice in him and in his goodness and righteousness and in his sovereignty and in his faithfulness. And we do these things because of who he is and because he is coming. Here's how the psalmist ends the psalm. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in faithfulness. We can praise him for that. And so this Christmas, as we celebrate his coming, both of his comings, we look back gratefully and reflect on his first coming and we anticipatingly look ahead to his second coming and while we do while we look both directions may we do it praising worshiping singing rejoicing exalting ascribing fearing declaring and saying and telling he's worthy of it all the whole thing i'm going to invite the band to come on up now. We're going to do this. We're going to sing a couple songs to the Lord. And we're going to give him the glory, do his name. And as they come up, I'm going to pray for us. You are all of these things and more, Father. And that you would squeeze all of this into Jesus Christ in bodily form is amazing. And that you would send him to earth to walk in our shoes and then to die is also amazing, even more amazing. And then while we're standing between the first coming and looking forward to the second coming, we look forward to, we expect, we anticipate the time in which he will return and he will make all things right and he will reign forever and ever and ever. And we want to praise you for those things and worship you for those things and exalt you and even revel in those things. We revel in your grace, your mercy, your steadfast love that you came once, you're going to come again. So thank you, Father, for those truths. And even now, let us praise you, let us worship you, and let us, let us invite others to do the same. And we ask these in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing. Um, you, what is that? Joy to the world, the Lord has come. That's a past tense statement. It's a future tense statement. Right now, he's standing, at, sitting at the right hand of God over all these things. And when the Lord says, when God the Father says this time, he's coming. We worship him. We appreciate him. We look to him. So as we go this week, do so. Love to see you on Saturday night at the uh, Christmas Eve service. And until then, go praise the Lord. Have a good day. Oh, God.